why I want to come back for services this evening. This is number nine now. Because our elders have designated this as a time for us to learn and grow. I love our elders. I appreciate them. I esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, as we are commanded in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I know, having grown up in the home of an elder, I know that their job is not an easy one. And I know that they are concerned about the souls of this congregation. And if they set a time for us to gather and look at God's word and, and lift our voices in praise, and whether it's Wednesday night or Sunday morning at uh, 9.30 instead of just 10.30, I'm going to do my best to be there because they have so designated that time. <clears throat> One thing about the announcement that was made about Africa, uh, today was supposed to be the deadline for bringing stuff. Let me say that differently. Today is the deadline for bringing stuff. Tonight, if you have stuff you haven't brought, bring it tonight, okay? Which is another reason to come back tonight, maybe. <laughs> but uh, um, the, the reason is we have to start trying to pack the stuff, and this in, is going to involve several efforts to pack and weigh and repack and redistribute and you know it's going to take a while to get everything together and so that's why today is the deadline but we greatly appreciate everything that has been brought all of the words of encouragement that you've given us and the financial support both from the congregation as a whole and from some of you as individuals we really really do appreciate it I spent a couple of hours on Friday with Josh going over some of the lessons uh, from the book of John that he's going to be teaching there. And I think he's really getting excited about this, looking forward to it also. It's amazing the power that little words have. Honey, I really appreciate you cooking this meal for me. But, now there's a little word, okay? But it changes what went before. It introduces something maybe not quite so pleasant, but I grabbed something to eat on the way home. I'm already full. Or even worse, because men are slow to learn. This, this just isn't as good as what my mom makes. <laughs> The word but there makes a big difference. Even without knowing what comes after, you know something is coming that changes things, right? I was going to do my homework, but you can come up with any kind of excuse you want to come up with there, but it means the homework didn't get done. Little words have the power to change our lives. Try those. I do. Little words, right? That change our lives. This is true in Scripture. First John 1 and verse 7 says, We walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. But that's not what it says. Because there's a little word there. It says, If we walk in the light. And that changes it from a declaration to a condition if we walk in the light. That little word makes the difference. Satan has used this to his advantage. In Genesis 2 and verse 17, God said about the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Satan came along and changed it just slightly. He added one slight small word to it. In Genesis 3, 4, he said, Ye shall not surely die. And that lie changed the whole world, the course of history, and affects us still today. I'm going to be looking at a little word today, the word all. We're going to be looking 
be looking at four passages that contain the word all. And we're going to see how important that word is in God's scheme of things. And we're going to begin with something that actually blows my mind. I have trouble conceiving of this. Let's start in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Where Jesus said, All power is given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, or make disciples of, notice this, all nations. He says, All power is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. This is why we call this the Great Commission. Because it encompasses so much. To teach all nations and to teach them everything that Christ had taught to the apostles. This is a task that is beyond comprehension. At this point, he's speaking to 11 men, giving them this commission. How in the world could they possibly even, how could they teach all of the things that Jesus had taught them? How could they teach things that they didn't even understand when Jesus spoke them to them? To them? In Luke 9, 44 and 45, Jesus said, Let these sayings sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying. It was hid from them. They perceived it not. Luke 18, 31 through 34, Then took, he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put, and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Now you might say, well, he gave the Great Commission after he had died and fulfilled this. So now they understood it better. That's probably true. But there were many other things that he said during his ministry that the scripture is plain. They didn't understand it when he said it. They didn't understand it. Not only do you have that question, but how could they possibly remember everything that Jesus taught them in three or three and a half years? How could they go about, and, and that's what he commanded them to do, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And there's another part to this that makes it difficult. How could they get people to believe this new message? This was the New Testament they were teaching. The new covenant between God and men. And they were teaching it to people either who were completely steeped and covered up their whole lives in the old covenant or to people that didn't have any real knowledge of God at all. And they were teaching a message about a, a man that was really God who lived and died and rose again the third day, and they're preaching this resurrection, which if you study the book of Acts, is a great theme that they preached again and again in that book. How could they expect people to believe them when they preached these things that Jesus wanted them to preach? Well, this introduces the passages in John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 that tell us about the Comforter. We just sang that song. I appreciate Randy leading that for me. I had asked him to lead it, to go with this particular sermon. Because this was the answer to those questions about how they could go about fulfilling this great commission. This Comforter that was to come. This word, translated as comforter in the King James Version, is translated as helper in the ESV and the New King James Version, I believe, and maybe even a couple of others. It can be translated as exhorter 
it can be translated as advocate. It is so translated in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write on you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So it's not just the Holy Spirit that is called this comforter or advocate, but Jesus is also called that. I love the translation helper here because it actually helps us to understand why he was sent. Jesus had been grooming them for the task of sharing the gospel with the world. When he called them from their fishing boats, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. During his ministry, after he taught them certain things, he sent them out to preach to others. He'd been grooming them for this. And yet they were preaching a message. They were preaching the New Testament. They were preaching it without a textbook. Because it hadn't been written yet. And they needed help in this effort. That's what these passages here are about. Let's read these very quickly. In John 14, verses 16 through 18, he says, this is Jesus talking, I will pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, or I will not leave you as orphans, is that word there. I will come to you. He's coming to them through this helper that he was sending to them. Down in verse 25. 25 through 27 has already been read to us. I'm not going to read that again, but in chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. By the way, that helps us to understand who it is that Jesus is talking to when he promises this Comforter. The ones who would be witnesses, which is exactly the role of the apostles, being witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. But then in chapter 16, beginning in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come... He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. What I would like to note in these passages is the word all. It occurs again and again in these verses. The promise was that the Comforter would teach and remind them of all things. John 14 and verse 26. Whatever Jesus had taught them, the Comforter would come and teach them and remind them. Because remember, they didn't have a textbook. The New Testament did not exist yet as a written document. And so the Helper would teach them and remind them of all of those things that Jesus had taught. And he says in John 16 and verse 13, he will guide you into all truth. For whatsoever he heareth, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will guide you into all truth. This was the role of the comforter. He was a helper. He is not some mysterious, magical force that makes us feel good. That's not what is meant by comforter here. Not what it's about. He was a teacher. He was a reminder. He is emphasized here as the spirit of truth because it was the truth that he brought that brought comfort to the world. 
His truth was to convict the world of sin and of righteousness or, or judgment or to convince the world about sin and righteousness and judgment according to John 16 and verse 8. He is the comforter because of what he taught and that teaching still exists with us today. Not the act of teaching, but what was taught still exists with us today. And there is clear and conclusive evidence that this promise of directing, directly teaching and guiding those apostles was only to those apostles. And the proof of this is found in that word, that little word, that little unimportant word there, all. Oh. John 14, 26, when the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. All things. There is no truth yet to be revealed, folks. It was revealed to those people fulfilling this promise that Jesus gave all things. There are, are no new doctrines to be declared. Maybe we ought to go back and start singing that song, Give Me the Old Time Religion. Because it is an old time religion. It was revealed to the apostles in the first century. He will bring to your remembrance all things. And he says, he will guide you into all Truth. You know, when he says he will remind you or bring to your remembrance all things, he has to be speaking to those apostles. He cannot be speaking to men today because we can't be reminded of something we never knew. The word remind is found in 2 Peter 1 and verse 12. That same word in the Greek anyway. He says, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. That's that word reminding them. Though ye know them and be established in this present truth. You can be reminded of something you already know. But you can't be reminded of something you don't know. Jude verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though ye once knew this. This comforter. This helper. That was to aid them in spreading the gospel to all of the world came to remind them of what they should be teaching and to guide them into all truth. And then we have the question of how could they expect to be believed in fulfilling this great commission? That also was part of this role of the helper. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, it says they went forth. This is right after he gave them that great commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 15. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Verse 20, it says, They went forth and preached the word everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, the apostle Paul, who was an apostle, had the helper helping him in his ministry. He says to them, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Jesus came preaching with the power of the Holy Spirit, and His miracles proved that His message was true and that He was a messenger from God. And He sent forth His apostles with that same power to be able to heal, to be able to know things that they hadn't studied or learned, to be able to work various kinds of miracles to prove that they were the messengers of God and that their message came from God. This is what happened with Moses at the burning bush. When he was afraid to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And he said, they won't believe me that you sent me. He was given signs that he could work miraculous power to prove that he was the messenger of God. So this is the role of the helper. 
to help those apostles in that commission that they were given. Now let's go to another passage that also has in it the word all and takes us another step in this process. It's, it's a really wonderful thing. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All. First, let's take the all that says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You see, the miracles that the apostles worked, they were intended for a limited period of time. They were intended for the purpose of confirming the word. There are no miracles being worked today. The fake healers on television have been proved as fakes again and again and again. The mir miracles, the speaking in languages that you hadn't studied, being able to tell the future, those miracles, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, passed away when that which was perfect was come, when the New Testament was completed, when we did have the textbook. But look at this passage so that we can understand how the helper fits in with all of this. First, 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is not limited to Old Testament scripture. Think it through with me. Verse 15 is Old Testament scripture. When he says to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scripture, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. But when he turns and says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, he is referring to both the Old and the New Testament. You say, but the New Testament hadn't been written yet. He, it was in the process of being written. He was writing it at the time. And he knew that he was writing scripture. They were aware that what they were writing was Scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter calls the writings of Paul Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. They knew they were writing Scripture. So when Paul wrote, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, he's talking about all Scripture, both the Old and the New Testament. And then there's another all in that passage. The second all in that passage is that the Scripture is able to equip us to all good works. There is nothing we need beyond the Scripture. So when the Scripture was completed. We no longer needed the helper to teach us and remind us. He had guided them into all truth. You know, I think of, when I think of this, I think of, and this isn't my notes, this is extra, but uh, we, won't, we won't go too far down this uh, rabbit run, but uh, uh, I, I think of Acts chapter 20, where Paul made the bold declaration to the Ephesian elders I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That's a bold statement. I find it difficult to declare all the counsel of God when I've got it all written in front of me. But he had a helper. And he declared unto them all the counsel of God. And once that was recorded... Those miraculous things passed away. They were needed no more. You say, but it still is a message that needs to be confirmed. No, it's a message that stands having been confirmed, folks. This book is the product of the miraculous. And it's easy to prove that. Simply look at the prophecies about Jesus, written hundreds of years before they were fulfilled in his lifetime. Look at the scientific foreknowledge contained in the Scripture. Look at the marvelous and inexplicable harmony of these different authors from different time periods and different backgrounds dealing with the most difficult and deep philosophical and moral issues with one voice, not just with great harmony, but with great unity. That's 
the result of the supernatural. And so the Bible stands confirmed. It is a self-confirming book. And we no longer need that work of the helper, that work of the comforter, to reveal the truth, to record the truth. Remember, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Peter describes the writing of Scripture, right? No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit revealed the truth and helped them record the truth accurately and confirmed it with the signs that followed. And it stands having been confirmed. It is, in fact, all that we need. One more passage. I'm watching the clock. One more passage in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. It teaches us that God's divine power has given us all, there's the word, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. According to the promise of Jesus, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. He has not. He has granted to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That happened in the first century, folks. There is no need for ongoing revelation today. And someone comes along and said, the Holy Spirit laid this message on my heart for you today. He's not telling the truth. He may believe he is. He may have felt something and thought it was the Holy Spirit. But the message of the Comforter was given in the first century. And all things that pertain unto life and godliness were given to us in the first century. Okay, Rusty, are you saying that the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything today? I'm not saying that. He still does those things today through this book that he gave to us. Think about this. We're going to again capitalize on the word all as we get ready to close this lesson. The Holy Spirit... calls us all. Matthew 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor. You say, well, those were the words of Jesus. Yes, but they were recorded by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so the Comforter is still calling us today. All that are weary and heavy laden. The Comforter cal calms us today, not in some mysterious way that we can't really tell from indigestion, just some feeling that happens inside of us. Romans 8 and verse 28, think about what it says. And we know that all things, there's that word, not some things, not most things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. This makes my life calm. There is not anything going to happen that is not for my benefit, as long as I belong to God and will walk with Him and be dedicated to His purpose. The Holy Spirit still challenges us all. Matthew 22 and verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. The Holy Spirit is still challenging us. Through those words. And I know that Jesus was quoting the Old Testament. But wasn't that given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit also? Absolutely it was. And the Spirit still comforts us today. Revelation 21 verses 4 through 5. Look for the word all. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The Holy Spirit still works today. He works through this word if we will listen to it. If we will take it into our hearts. If we will learn it. And do it and teach it. And the work of the Holy Spirit is still ongoing in those ways today. We're going to sing our invitation song at Calvary, right? I remember that. 
an opportunity for you. If you haven't been baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins, remember the call. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can come if you believe in Jesus as the Savior of this world, as the Son of God who died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. If you will turn from your sin, Luke 13 and verse 3, confess your faith in Him, you can be baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins. You can come asking for the prayers of the church to help. Certainly we believe in prayer. And by the way, we believe in a Holy Spirit that helps our prayers too, right? Not acting on our hearts, but acting for our hearts and interceding for us, Romans chapter 8, with groanings that cannot be uttered. Because we know not what to pray for as we ought. If you need the prayers of the church, or if you need to be baptized into Jesus, won't you come as we stand and sing? Thank you.